Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and on today's video we are taking a look at a viewer's motherboard. Today's video is all about how we can possibly repair. This is the B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi, and one of our viewers actually reached out to me, said they were having an issue, they've tried updating the BIOS on this thing, they can't seem to get anything out of it, so they said, could I possibly send it to you to take a look at? So, yeah, it's, uh, it's summertime, it's currently about 32 degrees in here, sweating like hell so yeah what else would be better than to try and fix a potentially dead motherboard so let's go on with it okay so this is the msi b550m pro vdh wi-fi we actually did a review on this board a little while back which you can check out up here if you wanted to and we've also done videos on how to flash the bios which is possibly how this individual has actually found us and uh, I'm glad you did. This gives us an opportunity to actually try and, well, firstly, we're gonna test the board, see if it is just a configuration issue. That is a possibility. So we're gonna go through some of the kind of fault finding that I would normally do. If there is a problematic motherboard, we'll potentially go through some steps to obviously try and rectify that issue. And also I'll be showing you some tips that you can use for yourself in your own diagnosis for parts that either don't work or if you've got a motherboard that won't flash or all those kinds of things. Anyway, you get the general idea, we'll go through and hopefully at the end of the video, we should have a fully working motherboard. Wouldn't that be great? Now I should first of all say, we are shooting this video. This is essentially completely raw. So I've put some RAM on the board and I've put a processor in, which is why the, uh, the PC behind me isn't actually on because I've stolen the parts out of there. When you're doing any kind of diagnostic work, essentially you want to start off with as many parts as you possibly can that are known to be good and working. This is gonna rule out a lot of things. If you've got a completely new system, the whole new stuff, and you've just assembled all your parts brand new, then potentially any one of them could be a failure point. So by using as many known good working parts, that is gonna take some of the guesswork out of it. So we know for a fact the processor works fine. We know for a fact the RAM works fine. We're also gonna be using a power supply, which again, we use for regular testing, so we know that works absolutely fine. So that essentially is gonna leave us with pretty much just the motherboard as being the kind of the sole issue. So let's uh, get this set up, we'll get the power supply out, we're gonna need a graphics card as well because this particular board is the B550M. We are using a Ryzen 5 3600, which doesn't have a onboard graphics. So we can't use any of the VGA ports on the back to actually try and get a display. That is something which trips up a lot of people. So if you are sort of troubleshooting your Ryzen system, you've built your system, you've got your processor on, you've got your RAM, your power supply, etc., and you're not getting any display, potentially it's because the processor actually doesn't have any form of onboard graphics. So it's definitely worth checking that. And if you have got a spare GPU or an older PCI Express card lying around, always worth putting that in one of the slots just to test that that is the case. So we've got most of our stuff assembled here, but actually before I go ahead and put the graphics card in, we've got the CPU cooler on. That is the Snowman, the MT-4. I love the AMD clip system for that fact. You can just put it on very simply, take it off. Don't have to worry about brackets or taking them off the board. Very, very easy to do. Definitely worth getting one of those for your diagnostic work. But before we go ahead, like I said, something you should really check out. And that is the fact that the board is actually okay. So have a really close look at the board, make sure there's no defects in it, no bends, no warps, and also any of the actual pins that are sticking up off the board. Potentially these can and often do carry voltage through them. So if any of the pins actually happen to be touching each other where they're not meant to, that can cause a dead short. Therefore, obviously your motherboard may not work and it may cause damage to other components also. So really worth doing that literally just pick the board up have a quick visual inspection all the way around things like your rgb pins down the bottom your usb pins especially because the voltage carried through those and just basically go around the outside edge checking all those are okay things like your cmos battery reset the two pins for that make sure that that isn't accidentally shorted out that will also cause a system to not boot or not post so do make sure those haven't got a jumper on this one's fine it doesn't have a jumper on at all if you've got any other additional drives, M.2s, probably worth taking those out as well, just in case they are causing a problem. Look at things like the connectivity for your fans, etc. Make sure none of those pins are shorted out. And actually, something which a lot of people tend to overlook is actually on the back of the board. So looking at the back of the board, you can see this is where all the soldering is done and all the pins are. So make sure none of these are actually damaged. Quite often, if you've put the motherboard down 
on a slightly hard surface or something, there is a potential for these little tiny pinouts to actually bend over. And again, they could be shorting. Some of the connections on there are actually a little bit longer than others. So actually when you hold the board, you can actually feel it kind of pricking into your finger. So obviously any of those that you can feel which are protruding a little bit more than some of the others, definitely worth checking those and just check all the solder points are okay. There's no obvious signs of any damage or any kind of burning or any of the chips have actually melted. So visual inspection, always worth doing first of all, and that can save you a lot of hassle in the long run. So make sure you do that before you start. Another thing you should can do, which is a slightly bizarre test, but sometimes I do like to do it, especially if I'm not entirely sure. If something looks a little bit as if it may have burnt, do the sniff test. It's a very bizarre thing to do, but it can actually help with your troubleshooting. Most electrical components, when they've burnt out, they do give off a kind of strange odor. So get the board if you want to, and uh, yeah, give it a sniff. It should smell like new fresh PCB, well, unless it's an older board. If you smell any kind of weird or toxic smells, then a uh, closer inspection may reveal that you actually have burnt out a chip. So we've got the rest of the system set up now. So what we're gonna do is uh, give it a test. But another thing actually, which I did think of, which is another really good thing to check is with your USB ports. And if someone at some point is inadvertently put a USB stick in around the wrong way or connected a keyboard and mouse the wrong way round, sometimes you can actually bend the pins inside the USB ports. So again, a very quick visual check just look inside the USB ports and all of the IO ports. Sometimes you can find that the IO shield, if you've got this actually inside a case, the IO shield can actually have a metal tag, which sometimes will get stuck on the inside of your LAN connection, which again, could potentially short out the board and prevent a boot situation. So again, check all of your USB ports, just make sure there's no uh, odd looking or bent pins in there. But once you're happy, we've got a HDMI connection here, and we've also got our keyboard and mouse, which is essentially all we need. Don't do what I've just done. Now this is a rookie error, and I've done this to highlight, honest. I've actually plugged the HDMI into the motherboard. So because this processor is a 3600, it doesn't have onboard graphics. So even if we get diagnostic LEDs and it says that it's posting and working, etc., you won't get a display. So do disconnect it from the motherboard and plug it into a graphics card if your system has a graphics card. If you have an APU, then obviously do use the ports on there. If you've got an APU and you're using a graphics card, then you do use the graphics card because that will take priority during the boot sequence. So now we're finally ready, we can go ahead and jump start the board. I'm just gonna use a screwdriver and bridge the two pins to start up the system. So good sign already, we've actually got power going to the board. That is uh, an excellent sight. And currently we have got a debug LED on, which currently appears to be stuck in one position. So we'll just wait a little while. I've actually got the screen capture running over on the PC. So anything that does come out of these ports, we will get to see shortly. But currently it's, uh, it's not looking great. And we've just got the, uh, the color bars. Sometimes it can take a little while for the system to actually go through, do memory training, that kind of thing. And it appears that our diagnostic LED is just remaining on the CPU LED. We'll give it a few more seconds just to see if it does actually recover itself. We have, which you can possibly just about make out, the, uh, the RGB RAM is actually lit up. So the RAM doesn't appear to be a problem either, which is always a good sign. Graphics card fans are spinning, etc. So yeah, everything appears to be working as it is in terms of power. But we're not getting anything on the screen over there, which hopefully you can see in the overlay somewhere. So we have confirmed the, uh, the viewer's verdict that yes, the system does not post. So now we have to get into the kind of nitty gritty. So the first thing I'm gonna do is to turn off power supply altogether. And we're gonna let the, uh, the power discharge from the motherboard. I'm then going to remove the BIOS battery. You may or may not need to remove your graphics card in order to do that. This one you actually do because it's actually hidden under there. So we're gonna take out the BIOS battery just flick that out, put it to one side. I'm gonna use the CMOS jumper and just uh, hold that across there for a few seconds. Count of five should be absolutely fine. So one, two, three, four, five. I'm also gonna try and discharge all the power out of the system. So I'm gonna jump her over the power switch on the motherboard, the IO board. So do that for the count of five. You can if you want to, if this is in the system, just press and hold the power button if it's connected for a few seconds and that should discharge any power. Just to be on the safe side, I'm actually gonna go back and I'm gonna jump out the CMOS battery one more time for five seconds. One, two, three, 
four, five. So in theory, that should be all that is required. Now you can actually boot the system up without a CMOS battery. It's not advisable because it's going to lose all your settings, but just in case the fact that your CMOS battery is actually the problem, which uh, bizarrely it has been on some motherboards in the past, so we will give that a try. So I'm going to put the graphics card back into the system. That's firmly in place. And now we're going to turn the power supply back on and try again for a boot situation. So immediately then, yep, the, the RAM lights have come on and we're just waiting on the debug LED to actually try and do something, which currently it does seem very much like before. Normally when an AMD motherboard for the first time is powered up, it should try and do memory training, which will normally it will cycle between the CPU LED, then the RAM LED, possibly shut down, restart, go through the same thing. It could potentially do that a good few times before it actually decides on the memory settings that it wants to use. But it would appear from what we can tell at the moment, we still have nothing on the screen over there, which is this connected to, and we currently have a CPU LED. So that normally means that the motherboard cannot recognize the CPU. Now obviously if it's a brand new 5000 series processor, this board potentially may not be ready for that out of the box. This one I believe says 3000 series ready on the box, so that would definitely be the case. But this is a 3000 series processor, so it should be ready straight away. Now I do believe from the email correspondence we've had that they've already tried to do a BAS flash on here to try and uh, recover the board. So that's gonna be the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna get a USB stick with the very latest BIOS on it, and then we're going to try and flash the BIOS just to see if that's going to recover the board. If not, we are kind of running out of uh, options of what we can actually do. So let's try that and uh, fingers crossed. Okay, so we've downloaded the latest BIOS from the MSI website. If you want to see how to actually flash the BIOS on this, the, uh, the full edition, then there's a video link up here which you can check out. The video is about 11, 12 minutes long and uh, yeah, definitely worth watching if you do have to get to the point where you need to flash the BIOS to recover the motherboard. So we've got our... USB stick in the correct slot with the FAT32 format, the BAS renamed to MSI.ROM, just to give you a broad stroke of things. All we need connected is the 8-pin EPS power and also our 24-pin power, which we've got connected. Processor you can leave on there if you've got it mounted, but I would certainly suggest removing things like your graphics card and RAM if you can. It isn't entirely necessary. I have managed the flash boards without that before, so... Uh, yeah, time to see if we can get this thing back up and running. So what we're looking for now is we're going to press and hold the BAS flash button for about two seconds, just count to two, then release it, and then just be patient. What we're looking for, hopefully then, is for the USB flashback light to actually start flashing, and then for the flashing to actually change speed. So that means that it's first it's read BAS file when it's actually doing the first lot of flashing, then the second lot of flashing is then it generally programming the BIOS. So fingers crossed, let's, uh, let's see how this goes. So we're gonna press and hold for the count of two, like I said, and we're waiting for some lights to come on there. And already you can hopefully see that. Yep, there's a little bit of flashing going on there. And it's flashed a couple of times. The fans have spinned up and now it's flashing faster. So yeah, that initially is an extremely good sign. So that means that the first few flashes is can it read the USB stick? The next lot of flashes is actually transferring the information from the stick into the main system. Then we're gonna be looking out for a change in the actual speed of the flash in. And then hopefully in theory, as long as there isn't anything else drastically wrong with the motherboard, which is gonna be very difficult to tell, as long as the flash actually takes, then uh, hopefully we're gonna have a working board. So I'm not gonna hold you uh, on watching a LED flash for the next 10 minutes or six minutes. It normally is around about five to six minutes, to be honest with you. I'm not gonna keep you uh, waffling on while I do that. So we'll take a break now and we'll come back when it's finished. Fingers crossed. Okay, so sadly that was a failure. So we had the flashing situation, but the speed didn't change as it was going through. And uh, it was going for, I think it was probably the best part of about 10, 15 minutes. So that isn't gonna work. So I've taken the USB stick out and what I've done is I've gone for a older BIOS. Now some of these MSI boards will not allow you to flash the same BIOS revision twice or over flash with the same version. So you can kind of upgrade and it appears that you can downgrade, but for some reason it won't seem to let you do it 
to the same BIOS. So potentially, because the BIOS is from back in June, it's now July, potentially that could be the issue. So I've got another BIOS on this stick, which is a slightly older one, and we're gonna give that a go. So make sure you're in the right slot, and we're gonna do the same thing again, make sure our power supply is turned back on. Gonna press and hold for a couple of seconds. And actually, what I should show you, actually, before we do that, if you press and hold it, if the BIOS can't be read, then this is what is normally gonna happen. So you press and hold for a couple of seconds, and even without a USB stick in there, it's still gonna to attempt to do it. We'll probably see a couple of flashes and then the light will extinguish again. So that is the reading process, those sort of slowish flashes, probably get about five or six of those, yeah, and then it turns off because it hasn't been able to read the USB stick. So if that's what you're getting with a USB stick and a BIOS installed, then the USB stick either is not compatible or the BIOS file is not named correctly. Again, there's more about that in the video that we did on the how to do the BIOS flash. Which is up here. So anyway, let's uh, give this one a go. So this is a slightly older BIOS. So we're gonna go through the same process and see if it will actually, well, see if it starts reading it first of all, which will always be a good sign. Yep, it's uh, gone into BIOS flashing mode. So yep, got the flash a little bit faster this time. So yeah, same process again, and we'll just, uh, we'll time it be on the safe side so at the moment it's 16 20 sorry 18 28 so we'll give it about five ten minutes see if it actually does it and if not we'll have to investigate something else so we'll be back shortly hopefully okay so we're back and uh yeah we've tried a few other things i've tried four different biases now with various different usb sticks as you can see we're using a slightly different one now than what we were earlier which is uh, in this mess here somewhere now, there you go so that is the one we were trying. This is the one that I flash all the boards with, so I know this one works with pretty much everything. But I thought, well, what the heck, I'll give it a try. I've even got to the point now where I've actually taken the, uh, the CPU out to give it a completely kind of good crack of the whip, and we're getting the same thing. So we're getting the light flashing. It looks like it wants to go through the process, but it just cannot communicate with the rest of the system from the, the flashback side of things. Now, I have tried some uh, kind of other diagnostics. Now, I am not an electronics expert by any means whatsoever. I just don't have the beard for it. But what I do have is a temperature sensor. So I've gone over the various components on the board to look for any kind of specific hotspots. When you've got a hotspot on a board, then sometimes that can be a telltale sign. So using the scanner, it's an infrared scanner, so we can just go around the various parts of the board. It's about 30, 32 degrees in here. It's very warm today. But most of the board as we go around scanning, even some of the chips on the board, generally we're all around about the sort of 30 to 40 degrees mark. Even the VRM is coming up around about 44 degrees, which generally of most systems, the VRM is going to be one of the hotter parts. One thing I did notice is there is some sections of the board which are extremely hot to the touch. Uh, one of which is the, kind of the chipset down here, this is the B550 chipset. And <laughs> that sucker is really, really hot. Now, just scanning it here, um, we're coming up with 60 degrees, 65 degrees, which is uh, yeah, well over and above what it should normally be. Normally, the B550 chipset doesn't require a fan, so it's passively cooled. There's nothing going through it, obviously, no data whatsoever, but that thing is kind of red hot to the touch. It's certainly hotter than like the radiators in the house, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, it isn't particularly comfortable to touch. And actually, I did notice, just lifting the board up as I moved it around just now, the whole corner of this board is actually hot to the touch. Quite, yeah, very warm. So my thoughts are that the possibly we've got a faulty voltage regulator. And again, I'm not an electronics expert, so if you are an electronics expert, please let me know in the comments section. Scanning the VRMs at the top. So up here, we've got ones with a V-core, and obviously there's no processor in there, so there shouldn't really, I don't think, be any voltage going through them. But still, when I measure the temperatures on these, yeah, that one is not very much at all. And then we're going up to like 70 degrees, 60 degrees. And on the other side, that one's about 40. So there's definitely something a little bit screwy going on in terms of uh, voltage, power regulation, that kind of stuff, which I think is possibly going to be the problem here. So we haven't managed to recover the board, sadly. Uh, we have tried numerous hours now trying to do this, but 
my biggest concern is this uh, this heat sink over here it is ridiculously hot. And uh, like I said, even the motherboard on the on the back is I, you know, there's certain points which are <laughs> extremely hot, and it shouldn't get that hot. It really shouldn't. The amount of motherboards I've done with test bed, which is like this, and I've kind of manipulated them around, and you get the odd warmish spot, but that is incredibly warm. So, yeah, I think this board is a failure, sadly. Not much else we can do. Again, you probably could, if the board was under warranty, which I'm assuming this is, it doesn't appear to be very old, it looks like it's brand spanking new, to be honest with you. I would just send it back. There's no point sending it to an electronics engineer to try and kind of desolder or resolder MOSFETs and capacitors and all that kind of stuff. There just really isn't. It probably isn't cost effective. Certainly if it's under warranty, I would look at sending it back. Now one thing I did notice, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't spoken with the uh, the viewer who sent this at the moment, but I did notice on the box, you can probably see it yourself there, if I get on the right angle, there is actually an X there. It's on the B, for the B550. Now, having worked in uh, retail over the years, normally if you've got a faulty product, you try and identify it somehow. You wouldn't get a big marker pen, well, some people do. Some, you wouldn't get a big marker pen and write faulty on it. So, just a little cross there, to me, is a little bit of a giveaway. Now, the fact they put it through the chipset, X on the chipset, and it appears the chipset is getting red hot, my thoughts are that they possibly knew this is a, possibly a dead board and it's been sent back from someone, possibly sent out again just to be like, okay, we'll send it out again and see if it comes back, which is a very common practice, unfortunately. Obviously, if you get from like Amazon, Amazon warehouse deals, quite often people try the board, had issues with it and sent it back. So that potentially could be the issue. I am going to speak to uh, the viewer, send a couple of emails, let them know what my findings are and uh, yeah. Sadly, we were unable to uh, get this one resurrected into a usable fashion, but certainly it wasn't, from what I can tell, I don't believe it is any fault whatsoever of the viewer. So as far as that's concerned, I think it's just down to pure and simple bad luck on this particular board. Let me know what you think in the comment section. That cross over the B550 bit, that does concern me a little bit, as if they kind of possibly knew that there was an issue with this board or it had been returned once before. Let, again, let me know what you think about that. Is that a common practice where you work or in industries you've worked in? Certainly, I think for the PC components industries, yeah, if they're having an F or like a cross somewhere on a barcode, quite often does lead to the fact that yeah, it's possibly been returned once before. So anyway, we haven't been able to uh, resurrect this board. Hopefully you've enjoyed the content. Sadly, there wasn't a great end to the video. Uh, but hopefully you've all learned something and if you're doing your own diagnostics then you've got some tips to aid you in your particular adventures. So do let us know how you get on with your own individual diagnosis, I'm actually really interested to hear it. And also if you've got a component, a motherboard, whatever, maybe even a whole system or a laptop which you're having problems with, then potentially I might be able to take a look at it for you. It's certainly worth reaching out to us, the email address is down there, mike at mikesunboxing.com. Drop me an email or join us on Discord and have a chat and you never know, I might be able to help you out. No guarantees, but I'll certainly have a look at it and it won't cost you anything other than a little bit of postage. So I've been Mike, this is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.